Good morning, software engineers. Questions, queries, quandaries? Kind of works. I don't know. But I'm watching Piazza, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, if you need to chat, I'm around. So uh, drop me an email, post a private link in Piazza, and I'll send you a Zoom invite, and we can kind of go from there. We're in a little ad hoc right now until we get everything set up, but you know, things are going pretty good. I see that many of you saw my video, which is cool. I don't know if I like the fact that I have likes and dislikes on my lecture now in YouTube. Maybe I can turn that off. I don't know. But thank you to those who hit that like and subscribe button. I can be a YouTuber now. Isn't that great? Oh, I got to stop like shaking my desk. I just actually spent like five minutes down here um, screwing in an extra mount to my desk to the wall so that when I get excited, it doesn't mess up the, the recording and using my camera go blah and something like that. So anyway, hope you're doing well today. Hope you are taking time for yourself, getting outside, you know, Try not to going house crazy just quite yet, but I want to give you a little bit of an update before we have class tomorrow. I don't know. So after uh, President Ryan's email yesterday about, you know, not coming back for a while, um, it dawned on me it doesn't make sense for me to do things as quote unquote lectures anymore. And you probably don't want to watch a 50 minute video of me. Heck, let's be honest. There were a fair number of you that weren't coming to see me live either. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to record a whole bunch more, just kind of 10, 15 minute, maybe even 20 minute at the outside videos and just kind of keep them coming. And I'll have a schedule for you when you should watch the video and then do an activity with it. And we'll kind of keep going from here to, you know, kind of back and forth. So I'm still working on things. Haven't worked out my sweet graphics I'm going to have at the opening and closing of each of my YouTube videos. That's okay, I'll figure it out eventually. But for right now, I wanted to do a little bit of refresh of what we were doing right before we left for spring break. Permanently left for spring. Anyway, so jumping over to the lecture slides now. I should have that up and ready next time I do it. So these were the slides that we did right before we left. We were talking about modularity. We were talking about the idea of how do we take a really complex problem and break it down into smaller chunks so it's more manageable. So we talked about, hmm, that I'm in the way right there, but that's okay. Uh, it's a core concept of all forms of engineering. And so we, we talked a few through, see, and I'm not even going to do a new take because that's the true live sheriff lecturing experience is where I screw up and make weird sounds into a microphone, just like normal. So anyway, we looked at some examples, things like computer hardware, putting together your own computer. We looked at things you could do in Java code, the idea of, you know, breaking things up into classes, into objects. And that was a way of taking a tough problem and breaking up into smaller problems. So when we were talking about design aspects, we were trying to think about, okay, when we're given a problem, so imagine that you are given a one pager um, from a from a company, or maybe it's a, a job call, and it says, hey, here's the product I want you to build. And so you're reading all the descriptions of things, and you have to stop and think, okay, how do I take this probably complex thing and turn it into something that's a little bit more reasonable for me to handle? So many of you probably would start thinking about it in an object-oriented way. So you see we've got object-oriented, don't do that, Sheriff. Oh, no, I messed up my slides. I'm not used to pointing with a mouse. Go back to present. I have to just point with the mouse, not click on it. Uh, lesson learned. So one of you might do it object oriented. So you might say, OK, I have to build software for mm, Grandma Susie's recipe database thing. So you might have user as a class, you might have recipe as a class, you might have ingredient as a class. Um, you know, you're kind of trying to make it out based upon the things that you have. And then you would think about, well, how do those things interact? Well, a recipe is made up of ingredients. So that's one way of breaking up a problem. We talked about another way to break up a problem when we were talking about the different aspects or the different um, architectural design patterns. And we talked about web services. We talked about the idea of if you with rest, right? So you take a, an application and you break it up into its functionality things. I need to talk to square 
to get your payment information. I need to talk to Tumblr to get images or Imgur to get images. I need to talk to Google Maps to get directions. And you start pulling these services together. That's more a functional decomposition or a service-oriented decomposition. So a service-oriented decomposition would be high level. It would be what I just said, Square and all those other you know APIs. But what if we thought about the system as being a set of services connected together. This is what most functional programming languages do, like Node, well, JavaScript. I mean, Node's not the language, but whatever. So the idea that you are building functionality features and how do those features interact with each other? So our goal is to break things down into smaller, maintainable, manageable pro uh, problems that we can, or modules that we can then reuse. You know, we're making those specialty Lego blocks that we can use to build more complex systems. They're gonna be easier to test, easier to debug, and easier for you to update in future releases. Now, there's a problem of putting all this stuff back together. I mean, that's not the easiest thing sometimes, but you know, it's actually worth it in the long run, even if it does take more time to design and to build. So we said that any module could be just a chunk of code. Now remember, for the purposes of this conversation, for this part of the class, we're talking about decomposition of the software system itself, not decomposition of, I have a server here, I have Square here, I have that. Not that, I mean, that's, that's, that's good. But now we're talking about kind of lower level stuff. So if you can take a piece of code and somehow wrap it, so you put it in a, you put it in a function, you put it in a class, you put it in an object, you put it... That's our module, right? So we talked about how it's hard to figure out what the different modules are. It's hard to understand what makes a good module because it's going to differ based upon the system that you're using or the, that you're trying to build, the language that you're trying to use. So you have to really kind of think about it as you're going through. And I mentioned the idea that we want these to be reusable and testable. I am kind of going a little bit faster through here. So if you weren't here on Let's be honest. Many of you weren't here the week before spring break anyway, so you might need to go back and listen to the podcast as well. This is this is catch up time. So where we got to was talking about, OK, we've made our modules. We've made this beautiful chunk of delicious code that we can reuse in many different places. Right. How do we know it's good? How do we know it's something that we want to use? So we look at our precious little module and say, huh, what are some things we care about? Well, one of the things we care about is information hiding. And the idea behind information hiding is that this beautiful, sweet little module right here, I know what I put into it and I know what comes out of it. And I don't necessarily care what happens inside of it. So I'm making effectively a black box. Why is this good? Now imagine for a second, this beautiful, sweet little module needs to be changed out for something else. So what we do is we say, huh, and we throw it over our shoulder, pick up our new glorious module and plump it right back in the same spot. If the API is the same, if the input and the output are still the same, then what goes on in the middle doesn't matter. So by hiding this information, we have made a plug and play piece of code that is easier for us to update in the future. I know you've all seen the keyword deprecated at some point. Deprecated basically means, hey, we have a module that you're using. We've decided we need to change the API somehow, but we're going to pretend that the old API is here for a little while longer until you figure out how to build the things around it, right? So deprecation is a way of we have replaced the module with the newer, better module that has better stuff in it and you need to update your stuff. We're not gonna, don't need to tell you what's going on inside, we need to tell you the new API, but that's all we really need to do. So that's, that's why we have deprecation. But as long as the API interface is the same, you can keep on trucking. So, yes. <laughs> I should move forward in slides as I'm talking, but um, if the functions are the same, uh, this was the slide that I used in class when we were talking about it, which was if, you know, if insert, delete, and find are the functions, do I really care as a system if it's a file, if it's an array, a list, a structure, a database, whatever's on the back end? No, I don't. Because a good software designer only wants to have to deal with the logical part of the system. I want to design, I want to save a thing. I don't want to worry about anything else. In Django, the model is the example of information hiding. Yes, you had to figure out how to make Postgres work. Yes, you had to think about some of it, 
but you have not had to write any SQL code. That's information hiding. So that's the first thing we're looking for in a module. The other two are kind of ways of measuring whether it's a good module or not, and that's coupling and cohesion. The simple way of thinking about it is coupling is how interlocked are two modules. So if you have high coupling, like super high coupling, then those two modules always have to be together no matter what system you put them in. Is that good? Well, if they always have to be together, why are they two different modules? Maybe they should really be one module. So you probably didn't figure out where the right line is between modules if two modules always have to be together. That's bad coupling. Now, good coupling, um, low coupling, means that these two modules know how to interact with each other, probably pass by data, maybe pass by reference, but they can be picked up and moved into other systems and they don't need any extra stuff. So you want low coupling but you want high cohesion. Cohesion says everything inside of our module is a part of that module and is supposed to be logically a part of this module, okay? So I'll explain what this means when I get to the cohesion examples, but the idea is that everything in here is supposed to be here. Coupling is how much interrelated it is with other modules. So for those of you that weren't here, don't, don't freak. I'm not going to make you memorize this. Of course, I guess now it doesn't matter, right? It's everything's open note as far as tests go. So memorize every. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what these are basically laying out is from good to terrible, the levels of coupling. I don't expect you to memorize it. I do kind of expect you to know why they're good to bad. So good coupling here at the top, data coupling, that's when... Um, Two modules are only interacting by passing data back and forth. So this might be too soon. They're practicing good social distancing. Uh, they're just passing information back. They're not getting too close. They they are actually, maybe it's too soon, but you know what? We're all kind of dealing with it too. And sometimes humor is the best we got. Um, but they're only dealing with each other by passing bits of information back and forth. Now, as we move further down, we increase the amount of interaction between the two modules. So for instance, if the two modules are operating on the same array list. Well, now they're more intertwined, right? They both have to have that array list in order to work. Or maybe one module has to pass a bit of control over to the other to say, okay, I did my thing, now you new thing, you are now gonna do option two or whatever it might be. So now they're more connected because there has to be some instructions passed from one to the next. Until it gets super bad, which is one module, I keep hitting my microphone, one module actually changes a private data member inside of the other module. That's bad. That's that's real bad. I mean, that's, you, you never want that in an object-oriented code anyway. You want to interact with things through methods, not through directly changing fields. Um, but that's, that's how the worst form of coupling happens. So you want low coupling, and you want uh, high cohesion. Next thing we're talking about, you don't want things having to change other, other pieces, internal functionality. So as far as cohesion goes, the idea is you want everything inside the module to be a part of the module and nothing else there. And this is where a lot of us sometimes get in trouble because you're building a system and you thought of a new feature and you don't really want to make a new file. So you shove a function in a file where it's not supposed to go. Or maybe you make a file called utilities and then you put everything in utilities and you import utilities everywhere and you think you're brilliant because you've made one library that does everything. No, you're sloppy because what you actually did was you made a file that is only good for your one system and if you ever wanted to reuse any of that code, you'd have to dig into that utilities file, find the individual function, rip out the code that's only meant for that one system, and then pray you remember what it does. I'm speaking from experience because I've done this many times. Um... Sometimes it takes a while to learn your own lessons. So, functional cohesion means that everything inside the module is supposed to be there and is a part of that module. Then it kind of goes down from there, but the going down at that point is more, there's different ways that things could be put into the same system for some reason. So for instance, you could have two things in the same place because they um, are both part of the login sequence, okay? That might make sense, but maybe not. Maybe you put everything that has to do with the printer in the same thing. Okay, maybe, maybe not. 
maybe you put things in the same thing because um, you have a you have a set of functions that go A, B, C, D. And because they always go A, B, C, D, you think, okay, I'll make a module that only does the A, B, C, D stuff. You should handle that in kind of your main operation, not necessarily in its own module. So, and then my favorite there is coincidental cohesion. That is the, I have a kitchen sink. I will dump everything in there. Yeah, don't do that either. Let's, let's avoid doing that. So then we talked about what does MVC look like and what does Django look like as far as high and low coupling and high and low cohesion. And what we decided is that MVC kind of has middle level coupling because if you think about it, you can make some pretty nice interchangeable views. That's the whole purpose of MVC is you can kind of change out those views. But the connection between model to view to controller, yeah, that, you know, there is some coupling there because you, you are going to create kind of a path between them. This isn't a bad thing, it's just you need to understand it. Cohesion's tricky though. Because cohesion is logically based, cohesion's really up to the designer. Some of you probably are doing a very good job making sure you're making different views and models and controllers for everything, but I've definitely seen some Django projects where there's basically one view and then they swap, or one controller and they swap out all the views. Don't do that, that's poor cohesion. Follow good practices, and that's how you're going to end up with a better system at the end. So, um, yeah, this is where we're getting off uh, today. So, where we're going to go next is how do we do this decomposition? How do we take that problem statement and say, okay, I know I need to make modules. I know I want modules that don't, don't rely too much on other modules and have good stuff in them. Good and they should be hiding their design decisions. Also good. I know what I'm looking for. How do I do it? How do I take that problem statement, read it, and then try and figure out what to do? That's what we're gonna do in our next video. We're gonna start with decomposition. This would have been the lecture we would have done on Tuesday of this week. We'll pick it up now. I will do about 15 or 20 minutes on how to do the different types of decomposition. Then I'm gonna cut you loose on the next guided practice that you'll do at home. I'll give you a day or so to do that. We'll come back and talk about what you did and I'll keep filling out the schedule as we go. I wanna make sure I'm as flexible um, with my lecture time as with you so that you make sure that, you know, you have a lot of other stuff going on. I recognize that. So I wanna make sure that you can kind of get to 3240 when you need to and kind of can keep moving. I will say though, you really need to make sure you're touching base with your team. Um, Slack now more than ever. Now, if you wanna start using Zoom, whatever it might be, Make sure your team knows what's going on. Um, are we going to have a sprint check on Monday? I want to check in with everyone on, by Monday and kind of know where we're at. We're going to have a CS3240 staff meeting on Friday. So I'll make some very quick, I'll make some decisions on whether there'll actually be a graded sprint check on Monday very soon and let you know. But your, your team should continue working on it. I mean, you've actually, you've, craziness aside there has been time so theoretically you might have made some progress but i recognize that it might not have been optimal progress so i'm gonna talk to the tas i'm gonna look at the schedule i'll get back to you as soon as i can this was our review of where we're up to i'll post the next module as soon as i can hope you're doing well post on piazza if you have any questions like and subscribe there at the uh, follow like and subscribe i need to go watch some youtubers and figure out what i'm supposed to say Nah. Anyway, actually what I probably should definitely do is at some point drop back here to full camera so you get that view of my office slash spare bedroom slash all the stuff I tossed off of my desk because I'm trying to clean my desk. Yeah, isn't that great? Um, you can see my switch case and all sorts of other things. So um, hope you're doing well. Miss seeing you guys and gals, of course. Guys is more than Northeast, just kind of everyone, whatever. Miss seeing y'all. Come say hi in Piazza. If you want to chat, let me know. Otherwise... I'll see you next time. Bye.